Um, so yes, hi everyone. My name is Maggie Thompson. I am a graduate student at UC Santa Cruz. It's a real honor to be here today to get to tell you all about the meteorite outgassing experiments that I have been doing over the last year or so in the lab and how these can inform chemical abundances of super Earth and other lower mass rocky planet atmospheres. Of course, I'd like to take a moment to thank my collaborators. It's not intimidating at all to go right after my advisor, Jonathan Fortney and Miriam Tellis, both at UC Santa Cruz, and others, including Laura Schaefer, who we will hear from later this afternoon, and others who help make this work possible. To start, here's a brief roadmap of where we're going for the next few minutes. I'm going to start by discussing the different possible formation mechanisms for super Earth and other lower mass planet atmospheres, and also talk about some of the assumptions that we typically put in our models for what these atmospheres are likely made out of. Then I'll motivate how meteorites can help inform the initial super Earth atmospheres that we expect, and therefore motivating why we're doing experiments in the lab and explain our setup. Then I'll discuss some of our current experimental results and future work. So to start, how do super Earths obtain their atmospheres? I think clearly this is very much an unanswered question and very important within the field. And it's likely that super Earths are going to have a wide, diverse range of atmospheres from what we've been talking about earlier this morning, hydrogen-rich primary atmospheres that accrete from the stellar nebula to potentially terrestrial-like secondary atmospheres that instead form via outgassing. And so here I just have some two little schematics yes, that I'm showing um, on the top and on the bottom. So primary is in the red and then secondary atmospheres is in the blue. And so it's likely that a subset of super Earth um, and other low mass exoplanets will likely not be able to retain significant primary atmospheres. Of course, as we talked about with atmospheric escape this morning, this is super complicated, um, but it's still likely that some of them won't be able to hold on to them for very long. And so instead, secondary atmospheres that form via outgassing are going to be important. So for the remainder of my talk, I'm going to be focusing on these secondary outgassing atmospheres. Okay, so I think it's been made very clear throughout this exoclimb that we're at this very exciting next phase in exoplanet science where we're pushing to being able to characterize the physics and chemistry of lower mass super Earth atmospheres and then one day even pushing to rocky planet atmospheres. And as Jonathan talked a little bit about, we currently don't have a real first principles understanding of how to connect a planet's interior or its bulk composition to its atmospheric properties. And I think this is especially true for these lower mass planets. And so until we have observational constraints that become available that we expect to have in the coming years, we have to make assumptions about what these planets are made of and we have to resort to models. So here I just wanna briefly review some of the common assumptions that we make in terms of what these atmospheres are composed of, looking at solar abundances or some multiple of solar abundances, or perhaps giving planets solar system planet abundances, so give, take Earth's atmospheric composition and put that into our models, or also ad hoc abundances. So sometimes we'll have a carbon dioxide dominated atmosphere or a steam dominated water atmosphere, or some ad hoc combination. So with that in mind, I'm now going to motivate why we would want to measure the outgas volatiles from meteorites and how this can help inform these secondary super Earth or lower mass planet atmospheric compositions. So we believe in general that planets in our solar system formed out of material that's approximately analogous to meteorites. And I'll talk a little bit more about that statement in the coming slides. And as we just discussed, some super Earth atmospheres or lower mass rocky planets are unlikely or are likely to form their atmospheres through outgassing during accretion. And so therefore, if we measure the outgassing composition from meteorites, this can help inform the initial outgas atmospheric compositions of super Earth. Now, when I have this, this little uh, schematic here, I want to point out that I'm not making a one-to-one -one comparison here. I'm not going to say that one particular meteorite, this little rock that we were lucky enough to have land on Earth, is going to be exactly what a planet is going to be made out of, but these are the building blocks, and so this is at least a place to start. So when I say meteorites, what type of meteorites am I talking about? For those that um, are not um, as familiar with cosmochemistry, I just want to briefly review that there are two main types of meteorites. There are those that went through a significant amount of heating and differentiated and melted, and that those that didn't. 
So for the work that I'm doing, I'm focusing on what a type of meteorite that we call chondrites. These are the ones that did not experience a significant amount of heating. They are believed to be a record of the original components that formed planetesimals and planets in our solar system. And amongst chondrites, there are other types as well. I'm focusing on two types. The ordinary chondrites, as the name suggests, these are the most common type of chondrite that we find on Earth. They contain oxidized and volatile elements, and they may have formed in the inner asteroid belt, although this is certainly an active area of research within the cosmochemistry community. Then the second type are carbonaceous chondrites. These have up to 20% water. They have the highest proportion of volatiles out of the other chondrite groups. And they are believed to have originated from further beyond um, the asteroid belt. Again, still something that people are working on studying that distribution. So why exactly are chondritic meteorites the most applicable to super-Earth atmospheric studies? So it turns out that the volatiles, the really heavily volatile elements in the Earth, like hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, are believed to have originated from a, the same reservoir that sourced the parent bodies of the chondritic meteorites. And so this is being evidenced here in this plot from Marty 2012, where they're plotting the isotopic composition of hydrogen expressed by the D to H ratio, um, and then the isotopic composition of nitrogen. And you can see in this like dark pink circle that the Earth's surface layers, so this is including Earth's oceans and the atmosphere, have a very similar value to if you were to average the ordinary and carbonaceous chondrites together. So therefore, um, in general, the average um, volatile abundances from ordinary and carbonaceous chondrites are pretty similar to what we see in Earth's atmosphere and surface layers. So this is a good place to start. Okay. So people have been interested in meteorite outgassing and its implications for planet atmospheres before, particularly from a theoretical point of view. So Laura Schaefer and Bruce Fegley in a series of papers modeled the thermal outgassing from various um, chondrites using chemical equilibrium calculations. And so here, this is some of the results from their work where they are showing the mole, fra the mole fraction on a log scale, so you can think of that as abundance, as a function of temperature and pressure for a variety of chondrites. And so you're seeing here the different gases that come off um, through doing these calculations. And they've applied these calculated outgassing abundances to initial terrestrial planet atmospheres, for instance, looking at early Earth and what the implication may be for that. But unfortunately, there are no experimental data to really constrain these theoretical calculations. And so that's where we have come in. So this is a schematic of the meteorite heating experiments that we're doing in the lab. This lab is um, a bit bigger than this table, but, but not by a whole much. And so what we have is a furnace that can go up to 1,200 degrees Celsius or 1,500 Kelvin, we place our meteorite sample into this little crucible here, that little yellow, that little yellow block, and then we heat up our sample and we um, measure it using a type of mass spectrometer called a residual gas analyzer. So this is a machine that's often used in physics labs or various other labs to measure and to check your vacuum environment or to measure trace amounts of gases. And so um, it's particularly sensitive to all the different gases that are coming off of your sample. And so what it measures is the partial pressure of different species as a function of the temperature at which you're heating your samples to. And so for each of our samples, we powder them. And so that means literally crushing a meteorite sample with an agate mortar and pestle in the lab, which is very exciting for me the first time I got to do that. And I'm only using three milligrams per um, experiment that I run. So I'm not wasting too many of these very precious materials that we have on Earth. And I'm um, doing all of these experiments at very low pressures. You can see here around 10 to the minus 8 bars. This is because we don't want any contamination that is due to just the air in the room. And so we're trying to be sure that we um, minimize that contamination. And we are also doing it so that our residual gas analyzer can operate properly. So this is um, just a brief overview of the type of experiments we do. We tend to first heat up our samples to 200 degrees Celsius to get rid of any adsorbed water. So these meteorites have been sitting um, in Earth for quite a number of years. And so they tend to gain water just from Earth's atmosphere that's not intrinsic to the sample. So we want to try to get as much of that off as we can. And then we heat up to 1,200 degrees Celsius over five hours and measure the outgassing um, volatiles that come off. 
So here's an example of some of our results. So this is um, data that we took for a really interesting carbonaceous chondrite. It's called Agua Sarcas. It was a fall um, in Costa Rica this year. So if anybody read in the news, it fell onto a dog house and the dog is fine, but the dog was named Rocky, which is very appropriate in my opinion. <laughs> um, and so this is showing you the partial pressure of different gases as a function of temperature that we're heating our samples to. And so you can see though, maybe something that's puzzling you is that for some of these gases, we are measuring potentially two different species. And so the reason for this is that the mass spectrometer is measuring things by their mass number. And so in, if you look at the periodic table, certain species overlap. So for instance, carbon monoxide and nitrogen have the same mass number, which makes it a little bit trickier in our analysis to be sure that we can disentangle between these two. So that's part of the thing that we are working on and trying to really understand this data. So we can now compare our experimental results to theoretical studies. And so here I'm showing you, this is now mole fraction as a function of temperature. These are theoretical chemical equilibrium calculations, courtesy of Laura Schaefer, that were conducted for the same meteorite sample that we measured in the lab under these same low pressure conditions. And so you'll notice there's a lot of different things that come off. I'm bolding the ones that we have measured in our experiment. We're limited with our mass spectrometer. We can't measure an infinite, num infinite number of species at a time. So the bold ones are the ones that match the stuff that we measured. And so then here are our experimental results. And so I'm just gonna briefly touch on some similarities and differences between these two. The main um, similarity that you'll notice is that water is the dominant species that is outgassed almost over almost all temperature ranges, not all. Um, you'll also notice that our carbon monoxide nitrogen trend is fairly similar um, in both cases. One interesting result is hydrogen sulfide has a similar outgassing trend, but ours peaks at a higher temperature. And this could be due to the phase that sulfur is locked in in these meteorite um, minerals and having to undergo a phase change in order to outgas. So there's a lot of different things that we have to unpack here, but this is just an example of some preliminary results. Of course, you'll notice some differences. One of the main ones being that hydrogen gas is the main, um, is the second most uh, abundant species that comes off. You'll notice I don't have that here. We did measure hydrogen gas, but we're not exactly confident that the hydrogen gas that we're measuring is actually coming from hydrogen gas and not in a fragment of water given the way our mass spectrometer works, it's ionizing the gases that come in. And so it might be an ion fragment coming off of water. So this is a lot of um, just exciting things that we have to keep working on. The main conclusion being that um, our results are showing you that in the lab, we're not reaching chemical equilibrium. And I think that that is um, to be expected and there's kinetics effects that we have to take into account. So just to close up, I um, just want to briefly discuss some of the future work I plan to do. This includes performing additional meteorite heating experiments focusing on the ordinary chondrites. I also want to modify our experimental procedure to get rid of the um, amount of stuff that we are having, the water that gets absorbed at 200 degrees. So I want to hold it there for longer and also measure some of these other gases like sulfur dioxide and water and things that are predicted to come out in chemical equilibrium calculations. And then ultimately, we want to place um, the results from these experiments in the larger context of our exoplanet models. So we want to simulate atmospheres that have a proper surface boundary condition, that have a prescription to treat outgassing and secondary atmospheres, and have our abundances informed by these results. So I'll just close with my two take-home points. Measuring the outgas volatiles from a variety of chondritic meteorite samples can provide experimental constraints to these theoretical calculations. And ultimately, the results from these outgassing experiments will help inform the initial boundary conditions on these low mass planet atmosphere compositions. Thank you. I'll take questions. Thank you, Maggie. Um, we have very little time for the questions, but okay, I see you, Jamina. Uh, if I remember correctly, and probably Laura knows this better than I do, but in their paper in, two, in 2004, they do compare with experiments and they find very good match with the, with the experiment, between the experiments and the model. So I'm wondering what's the difference between, uh, I mean, they were not using meteorites, they were using rocks from the earth, but they do compare with experiments. So 
That's certainly true. People have definitely heated up meteorites before, but no one has done it in such a way at looking at this goal in mind. So a lot of the old, older meteorite heating experiments are trying to understand what happens when meteorites enter the Earth's atmosphere. So they're looking at like flash heating, really rapid heating events. And so, yes, yeah, so some of the results are similar and that's really awesome. But what we're trying to do is to kind of create an experimental environment that really replicates the outgassing process as opposed to just like doing it from what the cosmochemistry perspective, which was trying to understand more about like the specific process the meteorites went through to get to Earth. But yeah, that's very true. We are definitely not the first people to heat meteorites. Okay, super, super short question from the front row. Nick Cowan, Miguel, is there a way that you can break the mass degeneracy with some other, something other than mass spectrometer? That's a great question. That's something that we would like to look at um, in, in the future. For instance, we'd love to be able to maybe like get a spectra of the gas as it's flowing. Um, there's definitely also ways to break the degeneracy just within the mass spectrometer itself. Like we can look at a variety of peaks around, say, like the carbon monoxide line to differentiate what's due to carbon versus nitrogen. Um, so I think we're going to start with that and then we're going to look into some other experimental setups as well. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah.